I, as an engineer, I'm a nuclear engineer by training, both bachelor. Wait, 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 wait. Did you just say nuclear engineer? Welcome to the Exploring Washington State podcast. Here's your host, Scott Cowan. So my guest today is Filippo with Due Cucina. I hope I did both those names justice. Can you introduce yourself and give us a little bit of your backstory pre-Seattle? I'd like to hear a little bit because when we talked on the phone the other day, to me, you've done some really unusual things. You might not think so, but I thought so. Well, I mean, uh, my parents think that are very unusual, so I probably, probably you are right. Uh, and the, and I still don't know what are we gonna, what I'm gonna do when I when I grow up. Well, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Filippo. You said it right. Yay. The name of the company is Due Cucina, and you said it right. So that make me think that you probably went to Italy a few times. No, uh, uh, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> well, then uh, you know how to speak it anyway. Uh, no, before uh, Due, I'm an Italian. Uh, I love cooking. I'm an engineer by training, and uh, basically when I start engineering, uh, I was like 18, I said, well, when I make my money as an engineer and I'm 30, uh, 40 years old, I will open a restaurant. That exactly okay. didn't happen. <laughs> I opened the first restaurant with my business partner, Davide, when I was uh, 30, with no money whatsoever, uh, but with a good background, you're right. So. I, as an engineer, I'm a nuclear engineer by training, but bachelor. Wait, 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 wait. Did you just say nuclear engineer? Oh, yeah, yeah, nuclear engineer. Um, oh, so basically, okay. I got my bachelor. And then, uh, because for me, it was a way for uh, traveling the world, you know? Uh, okay. We don't have nuclear power in Italy, but we have a very good uh, education system for uh, nuclear engineering. And so I said, you know, I get this one, and that's my ticket for the world. And indeed it was. Um, I got my my bachelor thesis in Canada, and then uh, I worked over there for a while, got back in Italy for my master, still in nuclear engineering, well, safety and nuclear engineering. And then I started traveling as a consultant for uh, University of Pisa, so researcher and consultant. I did that for like three years, so, so you know, good stuff. Like when you're 25, 26, good stuff. You travel Argentina, right. China, US, whatever, Sweden. And um, after a while, like, I decided to apply for PhD school mm -hmm. because uh, I had enough of Italy again. And um, I fell in love with China during one of my trips uh, over there. You know, I applied to the U.S. I, at a certain point, I said, you know what, let me apply to China. Let's see what they do. Let's see what there is. And I found this school that it was uh, the MIT of Asia. I'm like, okay, that sounds pretty fair. Okay. And I got admitted. So it's the Tsinghua University in Beijing. And it's definitely now one of the top 10 in the world. So I was pretty, you know, lucky in the sense. Um, and then, yeah, I, I worked, I, I, I took my PhD there uh, for like three years. So this was uh, 2012 to 2016. And during the time over there, I, we had this idea with my business partner, now business partner, before it was just my best friend, but not just, it was my best friend. He was in Australia, so I went to visit him in Australia, in Sydney, and um, we said, can we have pasta for lunch? And he's like, no, it's super expensive, or it's super crappy. And I was like, well, then we should bridge it. You know, we should do something about it. Right. Um, and we decided to make this uh, affordable, uh, high quality, and fast uh, business. So I went back, this was in 2013, I believe. So we started talking and nurturing this idea. Of course, he was, you know, he was working in tech. Um, I was taking my PhD, so nothing too serious, but, you know. Right. And uh, then what happened? Happened that my wife, I was always complaining about bread in China, and uh, she gave me this book about uh, baking from uh, Richard Bertinet, Baking Sourdough, and I started making bread at home. Now, as an Italian, you, you kind of know how to cook a little bit because, you know, it's big family dinner, so you're always there helping the grandma and so on. But as in particular, we had a wood fire home, and so I make pizza with my parents uh, since I was four years old. So I always loved baking. Okay. But never seriously, just baking. But my wife gave me this book and kind of changed everything. My wife was a big, you call it 
foodie here. I like him more uh, gourmand. I like the word mm-hmm. foodie, but just personal opinion. And uh, she come from a good background, so very good restaurant, expensive stuff that, you know, I never even tasted in my small town in Italy. And uh, I remember once I make this uh, mushroom risotto at home, and it was like only three, three months dating probably, and I say, hey, this is restaurant 11. And she's like, no, this is absolutely not restaurant 11. Like, Whoa, who am I dating here? <laughs> she was so strict and firm, and then she pulled me straight. So at that point, I said, okay, you know what? My business partner was like, hey, if you want to be a cook in the restaurant, you better make yourself an education. My wife was like, if you think that this is restaurant level, forget about it. So I got all of books and books and books about cooking and the science behind it. And then I started um, teaching classes in a cultural center in China. I started with baking first because it was uh, the one that I had more knowledge. And then in the, like in Two, three years, I expanded to nine different classes that were called Taste of Italy. So uh-huh. three recipes and um, f- for every class, I like Taste of Italy Florence, Taste of Italy Milan. And those were open to international people as well as Chinese. It was a, it's a beautiful um, cultural center called the Hutong or the Courtyard in China. And, uh, and then it came like... Out of the blue, somebody contacted me on uh, the equivalent of uh, WhatsApp or no, WeChat. I think now many people know WeChat, the right. Chinese messaging app. And I was on a trip in Vietnam with my wife. Well, yeah, it was already a wife, I believe. And um, they were like, hey, we, would like, we are recording this uh, series of TV shows about cooking. We would like to have you part of it. And I'm like, ah, it must be a scam or some student, so I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> So after three weeks, I go back and my wife is like, hey, did you ever contact them back? I'm like, no, forget about it. I mean, what's the point? And she's like, you never know. So I contact back and they were indeed the biggest, uh, uh, one of the biggest studio in China, the equivalent of uh, YouTube here. It was Le TV. Then now I think they went burst, but they were huge. Okay. So I ended up doing um, 12 series of TV shows with our, with our, how was that experience for you? Oh, man, that was fantastic. Um, it was like, uh, be yourself, be wild, enjoy every single moment. Because, you know, my Chinese wasn't that great. I was speaking like uh, seven, eight years old. Okay. Uh, you know, good enough. But when they approached me and I went to this meeting and there was like four people just for, uh, I, I, not for that, for scripting. Yeah, it was a script interview. I was like, I don't know what's going on. Let's give everything I have, you know? Um, Mm -hmm. And they explained what they wanted to do. So basically, we were like uh, supposed to be six chefs, old friend. They were going to either invite uh, or going to the house of some uh, VIP across Asia, like Korean, Taiwanese, and so on. And then two of us will uh, fight in a cooking contest. Okay. Uh, Of course, everything was kind of scripted, but we also, you know, gave us some uh, freedom. And then they're like, Talk about yourself or what do you do if this happened? And, and they got me. I mean, they got me, I think, mostly because of the blue eyes that in China open a lot of, <laughs> of doors, not because I'm that fun or something. I don't know. They, they got me. And it was great. You know, you <laughs> the first time. Uh, and at that time, you know, I didn't realize how big it was. But during the first recording, they flew us to Korea because it was a partnership with South Korea. On the flight, there were about 45 people in the team. Oh. And when I ended up in the studio, I counted there was 37 cameras. I'm like, oh. holy cow. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, I wrote to my wife. My wife is Malaysian. Uh, I wrote to my wife, hey, by the way, the presenter is uh, Tao. And she's like, what? Are you kidding me? I'm like, yeah, who's this person? She's like, she's super famous. She's from Taiwan. She's like, okay. So we, we <laughs> after like... Um, one month of recording so it took like three months to do the 12 session all between korea and uh, and, uh, and china i went back once to the beijing airport and i found my face on the on the billboard on advertisement <laughs> so you see me like this like oh no with the hoodie covering myself because i was i was just shy and um but it wasn't you know it wasn't like a, a breakthrough performance or um, something that went viral and everybody knows you in the street 
But there were a couple of instances in which people point a finger at me and they were watching this video. It was a, it was a show that to be thought and to be consumed on smartphone for people like uh, Subway Ride and stuff like that for like uh, not even millennial, Generation Z, like, you know, 18 to 30 years old. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it was kind of cool, you know, going to the airport, see your face there and going around to have a... The best part for me was like makeup time. I had some, my other chef like three hours of a hairstylist and I'm like, done. Yeah. <laughs> I'm both, uh, I got done. this. I got this. <laughs> I was like, give me some powder. Otherwise I'm going to be shy, but <laughs> shining, but that's it. <laughs> oh, I love so it, it was beautiful. All right. So you and your business partner, your, your best friend, how did you guys end up in Seattle? Seattle uh, is a beautiful city. Of course, we didn't know by then. Um, my business partner was in Boston, finishing okay. his uh, MBA. So everything is uh, data-driven, right? Every decision is data-driven. Even like, should I get married or not? <laughs> but uh, mostly we just decided to have a very engineering approach to it. And uh, we're like, okay, where do we go? Should we stay in Boston? And that was like off. No, because it's too cold. He was like, I don't, I don't care. This is also our life. I spent two years over here, too much snow, too cold, forget it. And me, I was like, yeah, my wife won't like cold. Then we say New York, and we're like, ah, New York may be Italian food to exploit it. You know, there is too much competition. People know a lot. Um, let's go in a place that is like more adventurous. They want to uh, experience a little bit more. And we compared San Francisco and Seattle. San Francisco was um, our um, American dream, you know, the Californian dream since we were a teenager. But then when you put down the number, you look like the rent, uh, uh, cost of living. And, you know, I have to uproot my wife, maybe start having kids. So we're like, oh, we can probably not afford it with what we have in mind to do. And Seattle turned out to be the city in 2016 that had the highest number of uh, college uh, uh, people with college degree. Mm-hmm. So we needed to have people that travel, people that understand what authentic food is, what good food is as well. Uh, a lot of disposable income. The city was growing like, a, I think it was like 10% uh, mm-hmm. rate per year. So a lot of um, new opportunity for location and so on. And we decided to, to come over here. Also, we had a friend that was working in Amazon. So we're like, hey, you know, if you have to do some trips over there in the meantime, we can crash on the couch. So he ended up like investing in us as well. So it was, um, it was a, a bold move in the sense, but very solid numbers behind it. And it mm-hmm. turned out to be winning so far because we would have lost so much money the first year in San Francisco that forget it. It's <laughs> just no way. <laughs> so, Probably. yeah. But then we, now we have our kids over here. So we totally love it. It was a good choice. Well, excellent. So let's talk about opening up your first location because I'm sure it went just, you know, you had a, you created a little document, check one, check two, step five. We're good. Yeah. I'm sure it went smooth and flawless. Perfect. No, no, no. In all seriousness, what was it like? You, you moved to a city. You don't know a lot of people. Yep. You really probably didn't have a great knowledge of the time of the business climate, what you were kind of getting into the regulations and all of that. So what was it like opening up the first location? All right, um, a roller coaster. Uh, I won't say probably nothing new than any other, any other person that start a business say, but for us, what was shocking was the uh, labor market. I was not expecting people not coming up to work in the morning without telling you anything. And that was uh-huh. really shocking to the point that at night I was waking up to check the phone if I have any message. Um, it was terrible in that way. But we were in Broadway, so we still have the store in Broadway. So it was a very nice location. And um, mm-hmm. a lot of uh, the, what gave us the strength and the force was that like a lot of people supported us because as we were doing just high quality, high quality, high quality. Uh, yeah, we can talk about working like 90 hours per week, but there's nothing you know different than any other person that start a business. Sure. Um, it was tough. It was tough because we had these fantastic reviews, much better than now. We probably like were a... 4.9 on Yelp or something like that. But business wasn't picking up. And it was at the time they were still called Due Minuti, where people was like, oh, I'm going to the pasta place on the hill. <laughs> so <laughs> it wasn't easy in that sense. Uh, so we were definitely losing money every month. Um, and it's it got tough. It got tough. But what we never banded and David really was, uh, David was at the time still working in Amazon. He went to work in Amazon full-time for visa issues. 
So I was uh, trying to hold the ship by myself with David helping after, after his long hours of work. Um, but he was like, go with quality, 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 quality. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we could have a uh, band on, save on products, save on something like that. No, we actually decided to invest even more on quality and uh, that eventually pay off. After one year, we start, we start seeing like increasing in sales. And then when we started thinking about it, we changed our name and we started dimming the light and we changed the plates and changed the tables. We invested a lot and it started taking off. But the first year was, um, I wouldn't even, I look at it like as a very, very good learning experience. I have no madness of uh, regret or anything we did, even though we screw up a lot of things, like a lot of things. Well, like what? I, I love asking that question. So you since know, you, you brought it up, give me one. Tell me something. Okay. Me, no, I'll frame the question. Let me frame the All question. Right. Plates. You're putting something on the menu. You you know. to, what was an idea that you had to go on the menu that you thought, oh, this will be great, and Seattle just didn't respond? The menu worked. The menu, okay. like the item on the menu worked. Uh, we changed them routinely, probably too often. Uh, there was really nothing that was received wrong. Uh, okay. It was great food and still is, but it was a bit more um, on the gourmet side, you know, these uh, confit cherry tomato that take me eight hours to cook. And sometimes I ended up at one third in the morning peeling with my wife and she's like, you can't keep doing this. I'm like, okay. Or um, it was an um, oxtail braise that we were braising overnight. Uh, oh, wow. So leaving the oven on and it was fantastic review. What was wrong? It was a lot of other things like, Plates, simple things like a plates. We decided to buy these enamel metal plates that cost like nine dollar each. Oh man, that was wrong. Why? Was, Why? Okay, because when you put something in the hot, the plates burn, right? And people didn't oh. like it. At the same time, they you know give away a lot of heat, so the pasta get cold very fast. And then as soon as they chip a little bit, if you're familiar with the enamel. Uh -huh. That they cheap, they start to have some, this little patina, this little rust. That for me was beautiful because it's like the '70s. This is my grandma's plates. People right. started posting reviews, and it's like, oh, the plates are burned. They can't even afford good plates. I'm like, okay, 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 hold on oh. here. Why people don't oh, like wow. that? <laughs> um, and then we had lights. Oh my god, lights! If you get inside our first restaurant, you need sunglasses. <laughs> uh, it was it was thought to be a lunch spot, but it turned out to be a very dinner focused location. Okay. And most of it, our constructor didn't realize they put the LED light on a dimmer on a 220 volt circuit instead of 110. So even with the dimmer at the lowest level, it was like a, a solarium. Oh my gosh. So okay. It was like awful, man. It was awful. <laughs> And it took like a little bit of time to realize the light played a big, uh, a big factor in uh, welcoming right. customers. Then we had a table that were uh, uh, inherited from the previous restaurant. There was a, a noodle shop. So they were uh, kind of crappy, you know, that beige sure. color, nothing fancy about it. Um, and people like didn't, didn't like it. I mean, we had a big bench on one side that, uh, it was used mostly to put scarf and jacket during winter than actually sit on that. So we changed, you know, these, these small things made a difference. We had the uniform. The, our uniform were black uh, with no, you know, no character, nothing. And my parents came to visit and I was like, Filippo, what are you doing? Change it. You have to be, you know, you with a white, everybody with a bright color. So now everybody's in red. Me, I have a white shirt. I mean, chef coat. It's, you know, when you go in those uh, coffee shop that they had those apron with uh, leather strips that cost mm -hmm. $75. Well, yep. they make a difference. So I already made a difference. But the food, the food was there and that is what kept, kept us alive. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to, we're going to bounce around from now. Sure. I got questions. I've got questions. And, go ahead. So I'm going to put you on the spot. What's your favorite dish? That it was on the menu or my favorite dish in general? Oh, we'll go with both of those questions on what? your menu. What's your favorite? Like if I were to come in, let's let me put, let, give me the scenario. I I'm going to show up today at one of your locations for lunch. Yeah. And I'm going to say to you, I'm going to take your recommendation. All right. What would you, what would you serve? Cause I'm going to assume you're going to serve me something that you really like. Yes. That, so what would you serve? What I really like change every day. 
So depends on the okay. day that you come, you're going to have a different recommendation. Uh, but I will probably recommend you something. I will ask you something like, hey, are you familiar with the Italian food? Uh, because we are authentic. And yeah, sh- if you ask, yeah, sure. Then I will say, would you like to go with something that like a cacio e pepe? Of course, everybody knows cacio e pepe now. That is very authentic. So on the saltier side, with uh, addition of guanciale. Guanciale is a cured pork chick that we cure in house and age in house. Oh. Um, and if you say yes, I will tell you it's rich, it's strong in flavor. Think about those uh, uh, shepherds that take the herd of the sheep and go on the mountain. What they bring with them is cured meat and those pieces of cheese. That's mm-hmm. what it was. So the dish is called uh, Grisha. That is basically the guanciale and um, the, the cacio e And that is probably my recommendation for somebody that knows about food a little bit. Okay, that sounds awesome, actually. Yeah, on the safer side, I will tell you our bolognese is uh, top notch. Uh, I will tell you that we use uh, Painted Hill sustainable uh, beef and uh, pieces pure country pork from Mont Vermont sustainable uh, pork, mm-hmm. and it's delicious. I mean, done in a very authentic way. I will tell you that is not the pasta is not drowsing sauce. Is not is it is it tomato based or like it's a bolognese? It's not tomato based. It's it's like dance. It's not like you know. And that's probably something that would really work. But what, okay. what I loved, is, I think it was a masterpiece. I did it for um, uh, First Start, First Start uh, Chef's Night. I had one of those as a donation, as a charity event. And I made this uh, oxtail beef tongue braise mm. with, uh, with a confiture tomato that is like a tomato that you make a slow roaster in the oven for like eight hours. And then I used that one as a base for the sauce. And it was unbelievable. That is unbelievable. But it definitely takes a little bit too long to make for <laughs> right. every day. But, you know, we still do it sometimes as a special, like oxtail braise. I, I like braise. I was like, I like slow cooking and the richness and the brick to the plate, in particular in a weather like Seattle that you need uh, every day a, a big hug when uh, the fall comes you know <laughs> well it, at the time of that we're recording this fall is yeah, in the I, air i look today so, and i'm like yeah i need a hug yeah so how is it today in seattle what's the weather like what are you looking uh, out at cloudy cloudy not too bad not too bad okay. it's not raining yesterday was raining and it was okay. very welcome because uh, i garden as well and uh, my soil needed water okay so i was happy uh, okay but yeah i mean it starts to be fall, you know. I love fall. Uh, the color change and there's a lot of things going on. The Dahlia welcome you every every corner, so it's pretty bright as well. Yeah. So I am on your website and I'm looking at your handmade ravioli. Oh, fantastic, man! Tell me a little bit about that. So those ravioli are probably the the thing that I could really put down in a very fancy dining restaurant okay but i have to pull only five on the plate instead of 12 as we do you know the, the smaller okay. the more precious right so people will pay 25 dollars for that uh, without being too too cocky it, it's really a fantastic dish so for the pasta we use um, these um, happy happy hand eggs the heritage one that okay. it took me six months to get it over here they come from arkansas and i had to convince our supplier to bring it in for us now okay. that you know, now a lot of other restaurants are using it thanks to our supplier. And I'm fine with that. They're super red. They're pasture raised, uh, beautiful flavor. And I'm very particular about eggs. I grow my, I have my chickens at home. Okay. Uh, and I grew up back home in Italy with chickens as well with my dad. So I kind of like eggs. Okay. Uh, so as you can see the color, they're very orangey. Uh, the pasta is very orange. There is no coloring, it's just the egg yolk. And then we use uh, organic baby spinach. And these are salted ricotta that we imported directly from farmers in Sardinia. The cost, right. uh, cost us a lot, but it's really, really valuable, really important. Um, it's made by Arezu. Arezu is the consortium that make it. And it really, the product changed with the season. You know, it's summer, it tastes in one way. It's spring, it tastes a different way because the ships eat differently. In mm-hmm. August, we just don't have it. So I have to import a lot more in, Ju- in July. So we talked to the farmer, how much do you have? And they were like, 500 pounds, send it all. And when they came here, my chef was like, chef, we got no space for this. I'm like, guys, find space. We need it. Um, so <laughs> and, and that, that's what it is. Like really, record, and then we use also fresh ricotta, hand-deep fresh ricotta. 
um, made here locally. It, it's a, such a beautiful dish. And then, you know, the classic pairing of uh, butter and sage. Um, the butter is, uh, that we use is a cultural butter. It's just simplicity. It, it's perfect. Then it's, when it's plated, it's topped with Parmigiano Reggiano. We only use uh, Parmigiano Reggiano 24 months over here, and um, we buy the whole wheel so we can save a little bit of money, and we have to open the wheel uh, ourselves. But also, we save some money, but also there is no oxidation, you know? We go through, mm -hmm. like, uh, among three restaurants right now, like four or five wheels per week. Each wheel is, like, 80 pounds. Wait, wait, wait. So, yeah. So you're going through 300 to 400 pounds. Of Parmigiano Reggiano, yes. Parmigiano Reggiano a week. A week, yes. It's a lot. Consider a that. Lot. Consider that one wheel has about 600 quart of milk. <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> I did not realize. I did not realize that it had that much milk in it. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a fantastic product, though. Um, wow. Okay. So, so how much, let me ask you this question then. Yeah. How many pounds of pasta are you Ooh. going through in a week? All right. All right. I, I think we make an average of a, let's do the math with me. We do an average of uh, 10 batches every day just for one store, or maybe nine. Each batch has uh, 15 pounds. So let's say 150 pounds per store. So four fifty a week or four fifty a day. Yeah, but that's only the flour without the water. So if you had the water for fifty, we go to six hundred. Six hundred pound. Uh, yeah, something like that. Six hundred pound, five hundred. Let's say five hundred pound per store per day. It's a lot of pasta. Yeah, it's we're lucky. Capitol Hill, we're doing about a lot of pasta. When I look at the numbers, sometimes I'm like, oh my god, it's like uh, six hundred pasta per day. So yeah, it's probably less, like five hundred pound. Wow. Okay. So one of the things I'm looking at, I'm on your menu, and I, I I've got to say, I'm on your just the, our pastas part of your menu. Sure. So by no means am I trying to say this is the entire menu, but I'm looking here, and at the time that we're recording this, let's be fair, because yes. this could change tomorrow. And I'm actually thinking but, of changing in the next couple of weeks. So less than fourteen dollars. Yes. For an entree. Yes. How? Well, I mean, we're not trying to turn this into a business episode. Yeah. But how are you guys? That's amazing that in the Seattle market, you're able to do handmade fresh pasta with all these ingredients at under fifteen bucks a plate. Yeah, you are. Uh, you're touching a good point. That's awesome. <laughs> you're touching a good point. When we started, we said we have to make it work in this way because we want to be in this price range and want to have this quality. Mm -hmm. Then we mm -hmm. have to make it work. Right. So we didn't make it work for the first year. We just we didn't. We just bleed in money. <laughs> uh, <gasps> but we didn't make it work after. We need to make like at least 280 pasta a day to break okay. even. And okay. we do, and then what we do is like if you come in our restaurant, there is no tablecloth, there is no service. Mm -hmm. We rely a lot on uh, uh, what well, definitely volume and uh, economy of scale, mm -hmm. and uh, we rely on uh, self-ordering kiosk, in particular now the COVID, so shrinking our front of the house member. Mm -hmm. We rely on cross training, so every time that everybody's trained in the front, you get trained also in the back. Okay. Uh, so smart operation. And um, everything that we have is uh, digitalized, let's say, from checklist to make it easier, controlling temperature of the fridges. So we say we don't have somebody going and probe every single fridge, for instance. We just have everything on the smartphone and we see what the temperature are. Okay. Uh, we, we save a lot as well on uh, uh, mostly really services save us a lot and volume. So it's not a fancy place. It's a very nice, welcoming place where you're coming for good food for a good time mm -hmm. with your friends. Um, and then, you know, some people complain, but I don't like here is I can't stay here for two hours and have a glass of wine. I'm like, you can. Nobody asks you to leave. But, you know, we don't have that kind of atmosphere where you like to chill out for hours. Right. It's right. really coming and going, coming and going. Okay. And plus, of course, we have a lot of uh, to-go order and delivery. So we could not do this with just 45 seats, of course. 
So how let's let's talk about in in, in the time of COVID yeah. and with you know uncertainty about whether you, a restaurant can be open or closed or half capacity or all of those things. We just let's just skip all that. But takeout delivery. Yeah. How does one keep pasta? How does one deliver pasta in a takeout in a good way? Look, I never had, I never thought in my life that I would, I would eat myself box pasta. Then life hit you with two kids at home <laughs> and your wife is like, Hey, can you think about, can you care about dinner? Sure. Take the pasta. Sorry. Uh, bag it, bring it home after half an hour, eating it. You're like, huh, it's pretty damn good. So what happened is think about a, a hamburger that get wrapped and then sit in a box that become all right. soggy and wet and messy, right? I mean, right. I still do hamburger to go. I don't care. But you, you have an expectation that the quality is going to drop. Our pasta drop about 20% and then stay constant. Okay. You know, at the moment that you close the box, the topping, the cheese on top is kind of melting. And then you start creating condensation. But that's it. After half an hour, it's the same. The flavor are there. Okay. So we always bet, you know, we are in... Uh, the first restaurant is in Broadway, a lot of techie people, so a lot of delivery. We were doing catering before. So the product was working very well. And mm -hmm. um, in COVID time, we just doubled down on that. We said, you know what? Let's start our delivery service, our app. And uh, we improve our packaging for sure. We'll make mm -hmm. some more research on that. And yeah, it works. I mean, it works. I, I, I'm eating it. Is it the same? No. Do I have customers come? Oh my God, first time in that I, after COVID, I'm, I'm trying, you know, in a plate, it's really is better. I'm like, yeah, it is better, but were you unhappy for, oh no, I was super happy before. So. Right. Uh, so what I'm hearing, what I'm hearing from you is someone who's passionate about food, but is approaching it with a very engineering mindset. We, that's my business partner. Me, I, I would love to be only passionate about food and spend time in the kitchen. But the reality is nowadays, there is a lot of uh, moving part, right, in a restaurant. Right. If you want to do delivery or to go, is an essential part of your business. Even like fine dining. I look in the area, Daniel's Broiler does delivery, you know, and they do steak. How do you make right. a, a medium rare steak in a box? I, I don't know. That don't costs know. you $60, but uh, you have to do it. And you have to do it. And at the point, you have to approach it with data in a way that give the best uh, um, quality and experience to your customer. Absolutely. And if your customer wants uh, uh, no fast ordering system, well, then you have to go and develop your own app and be tech savvy in that sense. You can't say, so oh, you... no, this is a restaurant. I don't want to be techy. Well, then you're losing part of the business. So did you guys develop your own app or are you using somebody else's? Well, we we partnered with a third-party company. Um, okay. I mean, not many companies develop their own. Uh, but yeah, right, it's, yeah, it's great. I mean, if you see it, you think it is our own app. It's on okay. Apple Store and uh, Google, but we okay. have our own delivery system. So it's just, that's what you got to do. Food, okay. unfortunately, nowadays, food is only one part of um, of the business. I'm sure that there sure. are people like us that are more on the tech side and people are more of about... Uh, super fine plating and nice Instagram story. And they work more on that to create awareness. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, food is just one part. So you opened your first location. How long was it before you, you opened the second one? Well, it took about three and a half. So we three opened, and yeah, and half? three okay. and a half. We opened the second one in, uh, in uh, December, 2020. Okay. So actually it's four years. There was, you know, we, it should have been earlier, but then COVID hit and we kind of paused it for a while. Mm -hmm. Then we opened that one in December. And then we opened this third one where I am right now in uh, August, 2021. Okay. So, and how, how are your other, how are the, the, how are all three locations? Because they're all, so first off, what, so we've got one on Capitol Hill. Yes. The, the new, the one that you're sitting in today is located? Is in, uh, no, this is the third one and is in Roosevelt. So, in Roosevelt? it's a Roosevelt neighbor, just a little bit north of the university. Mm -hmm. And the second one is in Totem Lake, that is uh, a mall, is a, uh, those uh, out, outdoor living mall. It's a mm -hmm. beautiful space. And of course, you have different demographics. For instance, right. Totem Lake has much more dining customers. Uh, they care much less about COVID as well. Um, it's just different. Yeah, just, just different. It's, 
it is. It's just different no matter where we go. Yeah. Do you have plans for further? Oh, yeah. Pasta domination? There's no pasta domination. There is a pasta sharing. Pasta uh, sharing. Okay. Pasta sharing. Um, we really try to be, I don't want to say a neighbor place, but we really try to bring and make people understand what authentic food is and make them understand that authentic food can be affordable. High quality can mm-hmm. be affordable. Okay. Uh, it doesn't have to be $25 for a dish of pasta. Um, okay. So yeah, our idea has always been to grow this uh, company big, uh, even out of state. So we are okay. currently working, looking for other locations. And that is why we have to, this, to have this engineering approach. We can't right. make mistakes because we spent all the money that we had in the first restaurant that was screwing up everything. So <laughs> now we really <laughs> can't make mistakes. We need, to no, be, no, we need to look at the data and be engineered about it. Okay. I, 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 I think in today's day and age, in a, I don't know what it says. So I think some people think opening a restaurant's a, an easy way to make money. And I think the opposite. I think opening a restaurant's an easy way to lose money. Because, go ahead. You know, you don't order correctly. You order a bunch of perishable stuff, and it goes bad. Whoops. Uh, you you might have missed it with the plates at first. So now you've had to invest in new new plates. Yeah, just- <laughs> things. I mean, it just and then staffing. Uh, I don't know. I, I'm I'm glad you're running the restaurant and that I'm not. Let's just put it that way. Um, and I also think though that. I'm so grateful that there's restaurants out there that are serving good food that are affordable prices that, that care about what they're doing. And I think what you guys are doing sounds so intriguing. Um, so kudos to both of you. And I have to come over across the pass and try it. I got to get, I got to get from Wenatchee over there and give it a shot. I will, I will be doing that soon. So enough about that. What do you guys do when you're not running a restaurant in that, you know, 30 minutes every day that you got to yourself? What, uh, what do you like to do for, uh, what do you and the family like to do in the Seattle area? All right. So me, I have a four years old and now I'm nine months old. Okay. Congratulations. Thank you're, you. you're a busy man. Yeah. They, they keep me fairly busy. Wife is doing a fantastic job with them. Uh, she's, we are lucky enough that she can stay home. So okay. the, the, you know, both kids have the good time with mama. Uh-huh. Uh, what we like to do, just do what the kids want to do. Go to the playground, go to the okay. park, go swim into a kai, um, go and fly a kite. Myself, if I have a little bit of time, I try to relax gardening, uh, okay. growing more vegetable, having the, making the best eggs that I can with my four chickens. <laughs> uh, we rarely so what do you, let, let me st- let me pause. Okay, so what are you doing to keep your chickens happy and producing good eggs? So first, you have what to does a chicken need? That I live in an in an urban setting. I have a townhouse with no garden, but in front okay. of it there was a, a blackberry marshland that belonged to nobody, and nobody cared about them. So if you don't take care of blackberries, they kind of invaded our small patio. So I started. Okay, let me clear a little bit and put some flowers. And then after two months, okay, let me clear it a bit more. And then COVID hit. I'm like, you know what? Forget about it. So now we have this plot of land that is like, I think it's like uh, 20 feet by 40 feet square. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I just, chicken, what you got to do? Open and let them pasture. Pasture, pasture. Okay. Then uh, I make my own compost. So all my, part of our company is also sustainability. And I bring this at home as well. So I do not have a, a compost bin for the city to pick up. We compost everything. Okay. So I have my white, no, black soldier fly larva. They come from there. I feed them to the chicken. Okay. Uh, they're super happy animal. Trust me, they're good man animal. <laughs> but you see a difference. If you let them in, uh, if you let them out pasturing for a week, the egg change in color. The flavor is much, much more there. Instead, really? if I'm busy and for a week, they don't know open and they just stay in their own chicken run uh-huh. not the same thing not the same so you notice it, it, it okay oh That's yeah fascinating. No, absolutely okay so gardening yeah gardening cooking mm-hmm. i really cook you, at home so is it safe to assume you like coffee i do love coffee i love the flavor i mm-hmm. in fact we have a tiramisu back here at the restaurant um yeah i love coffee 
So if you're out and about and not at your restaurant, where do you like to go for coffee? I like to support Cafe Umbria. Okay. I do not disregard people. Please don't kill me. But when it's cold, a Starbucks. I just a drink black coffee because I keep my hands warm. Um, I like, uh, yeah, Cafe Umbria probably if I can. Cafe Umbria. Yeah. And how? And when you're drinking coffee, other, I mean, do you drink black coffee all the time? Espresso. Or is that just espresso. Espresso. Oh, I love a uh, Victrola or Victrola. I don't know how to say that. Mm-hmm. Their single yeah. origin is outstanding. Okay. And then the Empire Coffee House in Columbia City. They not tried that one. Yeah, if you get a single shot from them, it's like probably ten drops only, but it's so intense. That's enough. Mm. It's just so good. It's so short. It's so good. So all right. So you grew up in Italy, and we're going to just make a stereotype. Yeah. That you grew up with good coffee. I don't know if that's true or not. How does coffee in Seattle compare to coffee in Italy? Seattle tends to be more burn. Okay. Uh, stronger in the flavor, in the burning flavor, in the toasting flavor. Mm-hmm. Uh, less aromatic. Uh, okay. On average, yeah, on average, it's not a bad coffee because you can really see that here they're trying. I mean, there are many more coffee shops here that they toast their own coffee. Than they're mm-hmm. in Italy. I don't know any bar or any, any coffee shop in Italy that, that make it their own. You know, we just get it from mm-hmm. different supply. Right. So there is much more research over here, much more passion in the sense. For us, it's more of a way of living. And in fact, for us, an espresso costs 90 cents. It doesn't cost $3. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so on average, either is much more aromatic, uh, more um, round, definitely less okay. burn, definitely less burn. Okay. That's the biggest problem with the Seattle coffee. You, you're not a fan of that that darker roasting profile. Uh, That's fine. Yeah, let's call it darker roasting profile. It's very politically correct. <laughs> <laughs> I got to walk the fine line there. Yeah, sure. I, I, I enjoy coffee a, a, as a lot. And um, the ones that you've named are all, 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 in my opinion, delicious. I even, I too will drink at Starbucks. Yeah. yeah I will. Um, but I prefer when at all possible to go and try, I I always ask the guests to give me recommendations so that when I'm traveling, I can, I can try a new place. So it's always, always good for that. When, when the family, let's put the kids on the spot. So when the family wants to go out to eat somewhere, what's the family currently liking? Uh, The four years old decide. And okay. she's usually up for pasta. Just okay. Now, but now we can't. I don't know if it's up for pasta or because she likes to go to a certain restaurant because she knows what's the treat after. So if she oh. wants frozen yogurt, she wanna go to Capitol Hill. If she wanna have an ice cream, she wants to go to Kirkland in Totem Lake, that is a salt and straw. Uh <laughs> if she wanna go to the lake, she wanna come over here in Roosevelt so she could go to, to Green Lake. <laughs> you've got a smart four-year-old on your oh yes yeah. that my, that's awesome yeah <laughs> that's awesome but um other than that she's she enjoy a burger she enjoy okay. eating a burger so, so let's let's give a recommend a four-year-old's recommendation for a burger in seattle where, where's she like to go uh she like eight ounces what eight ounces burger eight ounces oh yeah there are probably two or three restaurants here in seattle I have not heard of that one. Oh, you okay. should try, man. It's, in my opinion, is one of the best. Okay. All eight right. Eight ounces this- deluxe burger is called eight, o- eight ounces burger. One in Capitol Hill, one in Ballard. Yeah, I love it. Okay. Lily's right. Burger is another one that I like. Lily's Burger. Okay. Uh, and then there is a Seattle Rainy City Burger that is pretty good. Okay. All right. So... What else? So do you guys get out? Do you do any, are you in, into hiking at all? Do you do any outdoor activities or is it, I know when you're running a restaurant chain, you got two children, you got a garden and chickens that doesn't leave a lot of time. <laughs> the children are the issue here. <laughs> uh, we do like to go, to go out. My, my, let's say we like to fly more to different places. Um, okay. You know, my wife is Malaysian, I'm Italian. So the older kid, she was three months. She went, the first flight and by the 
the first year March already went four continents. Uh, but not because we, we like traveling. We have family members, so we have to go and visit them, right? Sure, sure. Uh, so she, now she's missing traveling. But yeah, we do like uh, hiking a little bit. It gets difficult. We short and yeah. small hike. Snow, uh, snow called me pass is our to go away. You know, it's like 45 okay. minutes from home. But otherwise, yeah. just here in the city, one place that was stunning for me was the, uh, damn, I forgot the name. The park uh, toward the north that brings you to the lighthouse. Do you know that? Um, let me check. <laughs> now I'm drawing a blank. You're putting me on the spot. I'm oh, yeah. I'm sorry. No, I'm telling you. <laughs> oh, it's, good. it's beautiful. I mean, we are in front of the computer. I, it's really stunning. It's called the, well, Disco- the Discovery you. Park. Discovery Park. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I will tell you. Go ahead. My daughter lives. My daughter lives in Austria. Okay. And she she's she has two. Ch- my grandchildren. She, uh, I'm trying to think how old my my oldest granddaughter was when she flew to the United States for the first time. Like she was not three months old, but maybe six. Yep. And then my grandson was probably three and a half months old when he flew over for the first time. So I kind of get it now. They haven't been to four continents yet. Um, they just went. They went on a little family trip to Italy for 10 days, just got back from that recently. So um, they went to San Marino as well, yeah. which, yeah. So um, anyway, so she, my, my grandkids travel a lot. So I think that's great that you're raising children that are going to be world travelers, even if nothing else, just to see family. That's, that's amazing. Um, it opens up your brain, you know, it opens up your mind not to think that you live always in the, in the best place in the world though, or at least see that there are other places equally beautiful right, or equally right, no, I, unequal. I don't know. Yeah, no, I totally. Yeah. I mean, to be able to go and, and see some places. So what, for you, where do you want to go next? Is there some place in the world you haven't seen that you want to go to? Well, right now I would like to go home because it's three years. I don't go home. <laughs> Thanks to COVID okay. as well. But, <laughs> um, uh, my parents, for instance, haven't seen my younger kid yet. Uh, but okay. we're planning a short trip to Hawaii, probably. Okay. Um, there is one place that is still haunting me because I, I didn't go. Is in China. There are two places. One okay. is uh, the Guilin province. Uh, and the other is where they film, uh, where they get inspiration from the Avatar. I uh, don't remember the name. That all those mountains, those pillar mountains that go up. Mm-hmm. Actually, three. And then I didn't go for uh, in the desert, like with the study Gobi Desert, where there is the the end or the start of the Great Wall. I was, okay. uh, I thought I was close by because I was in the province, but then it was still another three hour flight. I was like, okay, well, maybe dimension a bit too big. I didn't realize that. <laughs> uh, I think I think it's. I've never been to China, and, but I think the sc- the scale of that country is probably staggering it's i think it's like the u.s you, you get to the point that's like hey let's have a short trip to new york my wife never been to new york and hey it's six hour and a half flight uh maybe not <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know so maybe not yeah <laughs> well i want to get you out of there so you can get doing your business stuff today so before we go where can people find out more about what you guys are doing and and give us give us all that information I mean, Instagram nowadays is probably the most updated channel. Uh, okay. Soon we will start doing, I think, a TikTok uh, as well to be updated. It's just, you know, you got to do what you got to do. Uh, do so where, what's your handle on Instagram? How do people find you on Instagram? Uh, Due Cucina. D-U-E-C-U-C-I-N-A. Okay. Keep just want to make sure. Yeah. And okay. uh, it's fun. You know, you can update what you're doing. You can show what you actually do when you really reach your customer base in that way. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's the most updated channel. Okay. So we'll, we'll send it. We'll put a link in the show notes oh, to find you, you on Instagram. I'll also put a link down there to your website too. Cause you've got some nice looking photography on the plates there. So get people to try it. Yeah. And yeah. What else didn't, didn't we cover? Did we miss something we should talk about? There's probably a lot of things that I want to talk to you. I mean, talk with you. I mean like you, what do you like to eat? Well, just look at me. Do it, does it look like I'm picky? Come on now. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> I I am. I, well, so here in Wenatchee, okay, we do not have. We're lacking two things, in my opinion. We're lacking. Um, I, I'm going to use the word "good." I don't mean pretentious, but we don't have really good Chinese food, which Americanized Chinese food. Okay. So, what you consider Chinese food and I consider Chinese food very probably different. Um, and we don't have 
I just found a, a nice uh, Italian restaurant, but we don't have any real casual uh, pasta places. So I don't, and my wife tries to eat gluten-free. So I, I have to like go and sneak out to get the carbohydrates. Um, and <laughs> oops, I just admitted that and she'll hear this. No, um, I am a fan of pizza. I, I, I think pizza, I, other than pineapple, anything can go on a pizza. You see, and, I love pizza and pineapple, but don't, oh damn, I just buried myself. Did you really? You like pineapple on a you pizza? Know what? Yeah, yeah, smoked ham and pineapple. Yes, fresh episode, pineapple. This though. episode just went down. I'm sorry. No, just sorry, kidding. fresh pineapple. So, okay, so tell me something. I've never been to Italy. Is there any pizza around in Seattle that to you is like reminds you of home? Uh. There are many pizza, you know, you can decline pizza in many ways. And I'm, I'm right. not one of those people that say, oh, this is no Italian pizza. It's just no. Right. Neapolitan pizza is the one that, you know, you, you can actually classify and define something very strictly what it is. Otherwise, all pizza are um, respectful. Oh, sorry. Okay. They can be respected, even though that you can talk about the dough was good or not, right? Okay. Uh, I make my own pizza. Okay. So we. So what are you putting on? So if what are you putting on your pizza? We just go with fior di latte mozzarella. That's the classic. Uh, nothing mm-hmm. else. We use uh, tomato either from the garden or the one I use at the restaurant. Uh, they're very good quality. But if I'm outside, I do not deny that I order mio posto or um, hard to say. Sometimes tutabella, but right now tutabella is so close to me that you know I I can walk in two minutes that I just don't want to do that. I just make it at home. Mm-hmm. I if I'm hungry, payachi. I like okay. the crunch. I like the crunch of okay. the dough. Um, yeah, that's that's what I are. I want to say out loud. I I did not have. No, I don't want to say out loud. If I don't okay. have anything good about a place, I'm not gonna say anything. But other places, sure. Tutabella is great. I don't go there as often. Mio post is great. Um, okay. Oh no, beautiful, the best, the best of the best. I can say, bruciato. Oh, okay. Now I have not tried Bruchato that. is in Bellingham. Is on the island. Um, what is the island outside Seattle? The closest one, Bainbridge. 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 Yeah, absolutely. Hands down. Okay. All right. So that's that's my thing. Um, when I come over to Seattle, um, I pretty much look at the list of places my guests have suggested uh-huh. to me. Pick pick one that's near me and go try it. I, food wise, I'll just go try whatever I. That's kind of the fun thing about doing this is asking you guys. So hey, tell me something, and you'll you'll say this and that, and I'll add it to the list. And then as we travel around, we go try these places. Well, let me know. I might be able to join you. I would. I would love that. I would. Uh, that would be fun. I think we'd have a, an enjoyable conversation, and it'd be a lot of fun. So I am going to release you though to your daily duties because it seems like. As the kitchen's getting busier behind you, you're getting ready for a lunch rush. I actually have a common news now at 1230. Oh, well, then let me let you go. <laughs> and congratulations. And uh, we will talk with you soon. What? Well, thank you so much for having me. It's been yeah. a pleasure. Thank you. All right. We'll talk. Bye. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Join us next time for another episode of the Exploring Washington State podcast.